there. <clears throat> Welcome to another live show here. Um, it's a little weird here to, today because Wes is gone and I'm kind of working the board and everything so bear with me and I got these headsets on and I'm, I, I, you know, so many bad experiences with headsets. I, I don't like to, to, to wear them just because you know, you spend so much time when you record and stuff with headsets, it drives you nuts. So if you do spend a lot of time with headsets, make sure you buy good ones. Ooh. So anyway, here we are. Here we are again. I got Gail working the board and uh, the message board. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm here by my, my lonesome. We got the heater in here going strong. Good thing because it's cold in California. I got a little blast. Of course, I'm preaching to the choir, right? What are you guys in Minnesota and stuff? This isn't cold. Jeez, it's only 40, you know, 45. Minnesota, it's like, what, 20 below. So anyway, uh, here we are. I've got some things in store for you today. So uh, first off, I want to say welcome. Remember, this is your live stream. And if you don't show up, we won't either. And uh, so it's your thing. So whatever you want to do, whatever you want to ask, uh, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, today, the theme is this guitar, 1949 Gibson ES-175. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it, but I do have a, a video coming out, a, a long video where we really go into detail on the, on the guitar. Uh, but I'll briefly show you what's going on with it today. And uh, it, it's uh, available. Uh, you know, I'd love to keep them all, but it's like at what point you, you got to stop. Um, so... Um, Anyway, I'm selling this for a friend who's taken ill. And uh, another, um, another thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about, hey, if there's something you want to do, I, bet I have a lesson on it, okay, and a plan or some, some kind of thing to help you down the road. You know, we're all on the guitar jazz road if you're at this live stream. Of course, you know, we don't always just play jazz, but it seems to be the main focus for everything I do anyways lately. Um, but, you know, we all get on the road. Some people got on the road a lot sooner than you did. Um, and But we're all marching down the road. And, you know, when when you're on the road, you can look back and you can see the other guys are on the road and you think, well, you know, I wish I would have known about this curve in the road. So I'm going to tell this guy. So that's what teaching is really all about, right? A successful day, in my opinion, is a day that makes either your, the days following today, your day or somebody else's day a lot easier. That is a successful day day. So anyway, hopefully we have a successful day today. Let's see who's here. It's so weird having these headsets on. It's like I can really hear my voice and it's, trust me, I don't like it. <laughs> By the way, and I've been fighting this cold for a while. I, I got over it uh, after the live stream last week and then um, I was feeling pretty good. So 
I drove my grandson up to, uh, oh, about 150 miles away. It's a beautiful day. I said, let's take the top down on the convertible. We drove up there, and, and I drove back. And uh, he was on his way up to Lake Tahoe meeting his girlfriend. So I felt fine the whole way, but the next day I thought, oh, that was probably a mistake. So anyway. Hi, everyone. Tom, thank you for joining us. And Lewis Taylor, on the road again. Hey, Rich, how much of a living do musicians make from teaching versus performance? Private lessons virtual uh, versus online courses, etc. I have a friend looking at getting into it and would value your opinion. Okay. Well, uh, one... You know, a lot of famous guitar players got into the teaching thing. You know, Joe Pass taught, you know, until his career really took off. Um, it's a way to supplement your income, and it's steady. And that's why I did it. You know, I started teaching when I was like 15. And uh, I was just always, let's see, I could, I could make $3 giving a guitar lesson or I could make a dollar twenty-five flipping hamburgers an hour. Guitar lesson three dollars half an hour. It's six dollars an hour, and you know, of course, you don't work eight hours, but you work four. So that's when I got into it, and so I've been teaching ever since. So um, actually, there is, a, and I've been meaning to do this for a long time, and it's one of these things I'd like to. You know, in my old age, I'll finally do it. And that's put together my opinion on how to run a successful teaching business or how to survive as a musician. A magician? or No, a musician. And because you have to pull a lot of rabbits out of the hat. And uh, so what, what <laughs> I like to think of doing is of course you want to play, but nowadays it's crazy stupid to make any money. You made, you made more money 30 years ago playing than you do now. Everybody has retired uh, from their day jobs, and now everybody wants to go out and play. And a lot of guys will go out and play next to nothing just to go play. Well, it ruins it for the professional musician, doesn't it? Now, some musicians can do it, but you generally got to travel, you know, which is okay too, but um, you can do it. But most everybody I know has to supplement with teaching. So uh, online lessons uh, is a great idea. The only problem is there's so much competition, so much, so much competition. Doesn't mean that what you do won't be special, but there's so much competition. When I got into that, I was like the first guy on the internet. <laughs> it's crazy, you know. When I left GIT, I said I got to figure out a way to make a living. Uh, I started doing correspondence courses. I put an ad in Guitar Player Magazine, GIT instructor looking for students. And I did that for years. Then it developed into courses, and then... Um, and then it, now it developed into this library, and, and now things are, are so inexpensive. Uh, <clears throat> so I personally think personal lessons are the best way to do it. Uh, and uh, I, I don't do that, but if I was just getting into it, I would go back to personal lessons. I would film them, archive them, and... Uh, Make sure you have successful students. So we'll talk about that later on some, some other time. Uh, David. Hi, David from Jacksonville. Going to Jackson. 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 Jacksonville. Uh, Roland. Hi, Roland. Hi, Gail Severson. Tom. Hi, Rich. Any clues how to keep track of where you are in a tune while you're improvising. I often get lost with 
in my creativity and forget where I am. You know, the key is to know the words to the song and to always be singing that melody in your head. You know, you can do two things at once. You know, you really can. The days of vine and roses laughing runaway like a child at by so you I kind of know where I'm always at by the melody and the lyric not by this chord change going to this chord change and this chord change going to this one and this one and this one that drive you nuts you know so if you memorize the lyric Memorize the melody. Uh, you've always got that. And, and if you've noticed, like when I improvise, I always, if I land in a spot um, where I can go. Yeah, you, know, you know, jump and, and reference the melody again. Then it reconfirms where I am. Reconfirms with the rhythm, rhythm section where they are. Because, you know. They're doing the same thing. You know, the bass player, he's not necessarily going F, E, flat, D. He's already done that. He's going the days. He's playing and singing along, and everybody's happy. So um, that's the key right there to knowing where you are. Uh, hold on one second. I'm going to turn this headset down. It's kind of driving me nuts. Okay. Um, uh, a couple of inches of snow in Bremerton. Hmm. And wait a minute, 72. What does the 72 mean? Uh, boy, we've got some new new uh, people here. That's wonderful. Piawan Abuda. Who, where, where do you live? I was just curious. Howdy, everyone. Or let's see. I hope all is good. 50 units of vitamin D every day. F or 50, 5,000. Wow, that's a lot. Maybe I better do that, though. Uh, Jim Rolfe. Hi, Jim. Uh, by the way, I've got all the charts done, and I should send them to you just to, for you to double check. I took your advice, Jim. I have a tendency to really, when I arrange music and, and stuff, I, I throw all this other stuff in it, which I like to hear. And there's, a, there's students that... Uh, you know, want to want to learn that stuff, but I forget about what it was like when you didn't know anything, you know, and you're you're just starting out and stuff. And so I I simplified the C group charts. Um, so yeah, Jim helped me with that, and I sent it to him, and he said, "Gosh, this is more like a a B group or an A group chart," you know. So okay, thank you. Um, Carlos, hello, Carlos. Welcome, David Rich. I am about a week into JGI and enjoying it a lot. The materials instruction videos are top notch. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm proud of it. You know, I was speaking of exactly that, that issue of things being a little tough. More of what I think back on it, we do it starts to get hard real quick. So um, beware. You know, for myself, I think what, why I do that is because when I was learning, I, there was so much of the bottom of the pyramid stuff. You know, uh, when you're learning, you know, the, the beginner and the, you know, the intermediate. I wanted the advanced stuff. I don't want it, this stuff. I can't get anywhere with this. And uh, so <laughs> you, you start getting books. <laughs> Ted Green, Jody Ario. Good God. You know, and then 
transcribed solos and uh, studying with Charlie Shoemate. Now, now you're playing a game stuff, and uh, that that's it doesn't mean you can necessarily do it really good, but and that's why I try to spoon thing uh, spoon feed things to you like in the course and, and you work on your own development but to be honest that course does move a little quick so hang in there okay don't get frustrated would you recommend to get a replacement pit garden tailpiece for a ES where would you recommend a replacement pit guard and tailpiece well, you know, I just bought a tailpiece and a pick guard, actually, um, uh, I, off uh, a guy on Reverb, and I forget the, the guy's name. Was uh, I, I would just go on Reverb and type it in and get it. Tell you what, let's talk about this guitar since we're we're on this subject. This is a 1949. This is the first year that these came out. Okay, so it's got, a, I want to say a chunky neck, but I've seen a lot chunkier. It's, it's actually not, not that chunky. The frets, uh, it's been refretted. It's been reshot with and refinished in the 70s. Um, so when I got the guitar, I thought, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this. It, the knobs aren't working right and stuff. So I took it all apart. It had a Lawyer uh, P90 on it. And um, when I took off the P90, it's like, wow, wait a minute. This thing has been routed out for a humbucker. And so um, uh, the P90 left a little edge here, which he had a cover for that that, that covered that up. But... Uh, he had this shiny tailpiece on it too. And so when I had the P90 on here and I put on, I'm looking at it and I think, this shiny tailpiece just looks so out of place. So I got a, uh, uh, a relic tailpiece and put it on, it looked good. And then I decided, you know, it's something wrong with this guitar, the pickup or something. There's, took it apart again and the pickup was bad. Something happened. I, I probably broke it, you know, but I don't know. So I put on this pickup right here, and I'm super happy with it. Um, the pickup is a... Um, <laughs> rail hammer by Reverend. Now, he gave me this pickup about three years ago. He sent it to me. And I, I apologize because... Uh, Ken, if you ever do see this, that, my gosh, I, it took me this long to put it on. I put it on, and what it is is a P90 pickup uh, with a different configuration. It's got the bar there for the lower strings, makes them nice and tight, and then it's got a fatter sound with the pull pieces on the treble strings. Um, I also went and put a period correct bridge on it and um, um, as you can see right here this is where the the, the uh, p90 was but anyway this pickup I'm very happy with um, isn't that a pretty sound it's just a Sound. Nice and clear, it's got, uh, although I gotta say this, look at it, the granite, it's the pickup, but when you play this acoustically, it has got a certain sound to it that I haven't heard in other 175s. I don't know what it is. There's something going on here. Maybe it's because the wood is 75 years old. You know, I don't, I don't know. But the guitar is acoustically just has a different sound. 
So, of course, electronically, it's going to have a different sound as well. So... So anyway, um, I, I fixed the pots, wired it up correctly. Boy, I'm hearing a lot of noise in the headsets. That's one of the problems with wearing headsets. Where's this coming from? What's... Is it raining? That's the rain, my gosh, it's raining like crazy. Oh, <laughs> I'm thinking it's noise. Well, it is noise, but it's that gentle rain noise, but it's not so gentle. Um, so anyway, um, the, uh, the guitar, we're gonna, we're gonna offer this up. It's, it's all been real reshot a long time ago in beautiful shape. And uh, so anyway, there's going to be a video on more detail on this coming out. Wes always wants me to get a, one of those lavalier mics. And it, those, those are good, but it's all to get all wired up. I, it's like you can't move. So, um, anyway, um, the Days of Wine and Roses, the, the tune that I opened with, um, is one of the songs for the A group. And the tune is not that difficult. You know, it's at a medium tempo. But you got to know what you're doing. And then you want to learn how to double time. You want to learn to double time. So we're going to, that'll be our focus at the camp. Okay, yeah, god damn, we had a, a cloud burst right there. Um, you and the vintage 177, best sounding ever. Wow. Well, <laughs> maybe I should keep saying that. All right, so uh, I'll have to sell all this stuff if I keep it, but no. How, you know, in my day-to-day uh, um, -day living and, and dealing with guitars, uh, this is the only one I've ever come across. I've come across a few from the 50s, and I had a couple with the P90s and stuff, and... Um, they're okay. You, they're, 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 they're cool. I, I, I don't know. You know, it's just that you go out to gig with them. They're a little different. I don't know. But anyway, whatever. Okay. Um, oh, so that was hail, huh, honey? Well, oh, that's a trip. Yeah, we're getting, we're, they say we're going to get snow tonight or tomorrow night. We're on the coast. It was snowing at Hertz Castle, Hearst Castle on the other day. So you're in the parking lot. You can see the ocean there, the Pacific Ocean, Southern Cal or Central California, and it's snowing. I know guys on the East Coast see that all the time, but or way up north. Oh, okay, he never returned as a horse. Late again, but earlier than last week. <laughs> okay. Um, great pickup is great sounding. I have a 2006. He is 175. I think your pickup sounds clearer. So um, I I really like this pickup. Um, ra rail hammer pickup. It's um, put out by Reverend, designed by Joe Naylor. I know Joe. And uh, Ken Hans, I've known those guys for years. Wonderful people. They make beautiful guitars, man, too. You know, and they're not, they're, they're built uh, overseas. Uh, I think Joe puts, you know, he's, he's very, very uh, articulate or uh, very meticulous with the, with the builds of his guitars. So nothing gets past him. <laughs> so anyway... Uh, 
Whoops. What do I have the wrong? Okay. Uh, this one's oh, okay. So uh, the camp is filling up. People are, are, are coming to the camp. The camp's looking good. There's still some spots. Boy, if you can come, you should. If you can't, maybe next year. But you know what? Nothing is guaranteed. You never know when we're going to have a pandemic again or something. Uh, Mancini is the real deal. Yeah, I believe that. Do you know who owns? Uh, Kelsey Grammer owns uh, owns uh, Henry Mancini's house. I, Pat Kelly was telling me that. He did a gig at Kelsey Grammer's house. And uh, that was Hank Mancini's house. Yes, The Days of Wine and Rose is a sad movie about alcoholism. Yes, it is. It's such a... It, uh, you know, songwriters, uh, they're just, they just amaze me. Um, and not so much as, you know, the, the song itself, melodically and harmonically, is one thing, but they always get the credit, you know. It's always the, those writers that get the credit. Very, you know, not too often you hear lyrics by, you know. It's the lyrics like Burt Baccarat, right? Burt Baccarat just passed away. Beautiful writer, you know. Um, and uh, by the way, he was, uh, um, from what I understand, very well trained classical, you know, in 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 a lot in music. And um, his teacher. Uh, I just heard this the other day at a performance, and they were talking about him. And his teach, they played a piece from somebody he studied with or something. And uh, he, what his teacher said, you know, don't be afraid to just play a great melody, to write a fantastic, simple melody, because that's where it's at. But the lyrics are the things that paint the picture, right? If you look at a song like a portrait, a picture, it's the lyrics that paint the picture, right? And those are so important. <laughs> so anyway, let's play something. <laughs>
here's my little med medley. Didn't have too many fancy things in there, but hey, it's all about the melody, isn't it? Uh, okay, I love that. Uh, you catch enough germs. No, you, you get enough germs to catch pneumonia after you, you do. He never phones you. <laughs> That's just great writing. God. All right. Jerry Goffin spot. The early Carol, Carol King. Uh, yeah, simple melodies are not that simple to <laughs> create. That is so true. Oh, okay. Darius, I'm going to have to look him up. Thank you for letting us know about that. Looking at the rail hammer, is it the clear cut neck or the, it's the Nuevo, Nuvo 90 neck pickup. One tenth of, of my musical connections. I'm not very connected. <laughs> okay, let's see. What else? Simple melody. Uh, you know, I, I love it when you guys post, so please keep posting, okay? It gives me something to do besides blow my nose. I've blown my nose so many times I can't stand it anymore. Um... I finally realized Bert utilized many of the same harmonic elements in many of his songs. Yes, the younger me didn't have the ears to recognize the genius. Yeah, you know, um, he goes to the three chord a lot, you know, when you think about it. here so the three chord is a very I want to say pretty and sad chord within the key that's my feeling of, about it I know you, you might not think that but that's I can always hear the three chord because I mean in this case it's two of Two five of the five chord, but he focuses on that three chord. And then because he goes like we're in F and he goes. Right? He's on that three chord. Same thing with raindrops. Here. three chord if you start to get real sensitive to that three chord um, I think you'll find that it's really magical the Beatles used to use it a lot you know you can't help but use it but you could always hear that three chord sticking out and it changes the whole mood of the song I think that's what's fascinating you know keys keys different keys deliver different different moods you know different they say the key of d is very bright and happy same with key of b b flat kind of dark you know even though it's a major key same you know it's just the way it is so um deciding what key to do a song in uh, or to compose in i think is real important and uh there you go Okay, so Eddie Davis, what's happening, man? Did you get the charts? Uh, I finally realized Bert utilized. Okay, we already did that. Um, Eddie Davis, how do you start learning? Been playing rhythm for years, looking to learn new stuff. Well, get on the Guitar College Library. I have got tons of new stuff. You you know what you want to do. It, to grow, you divide your practice and your learning into three general areas. The first area is technique. 
technique chords, technique single notes. You develop your chops, okay? You know, scales, arpeggios. It's an ongoing thing. You're never done with it. The second thing you learn is theory. And I know it sounds like a, a terrible subject, but theory can actually be fun. Once you get past what notes are in every key, whoops, God, it's a good thing I shut off this keyboard because <laughs> that's how we ended a live stream one time. Um, once you get past that and you start getting into harmonic progressions and start looking at other composers, start looking at a Bach tune or something, you know, good God, holy moly, you know, and that's when theory is like, wow, that's so cool. That's when you start seeing the beauty of it. And then the third thing is repertoire, which simply means your vocabulary, the songs you can play. You learn to play songs, you learn to play licks, you learn to play uh, complete solos. And there, if you keep each one of those areas uh, fertilized <laughs> with a lot of bull crap, you know what? You'll grow. But it, it's necessary for you to do that. B.J. Thomas had their hit. Yes, uh, well, B.J. Thomas had the raindrops, and uh, what was it, Dion, uh, Dion, uh, Dion Warwick had uh, What Do You Get When You Fall In Love? I think, I think it was her. God, what a team. By the way, if you ever heard of D.D. D. Warwick, Dion's uh, sister, <clears throat> I saw her at Atlantic City. Man, Talk about a singer. Um, I hate to say it, but, you know, she might not be as distinct as Dionne Warwick, but she sang. She can sing. Holy crap. Melancholy is bittersweet. Three chords, sometimes it works, sometimes not. Mark. Hi, Mark. How are you? By the way, Mark, guess what I'm getting today? And I, it, it actually came. I don't know if Gail got it out of the box yet. She was going to bring it over. But it's a ES-165 with a mounted pickup. I had gotten a call from a fella, and he said, hey, I want to I want to sell this. Would you want to buy it? And I said, okay. So he's shipping it. So we'll, hopefully we'll see. Uh, Rich, have you ever had a problem with rattling in a tunematic bridge on a 335 guitar? No, I never have. And, you know, are you sure it's the bridge and not the wiring underneath bouncing on the top? Okay, I've never had that, never had a problem with rattling. Plug it in your amp and play it. You, you won't hear it then. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I've never have uh, experienced that. I was going to put a tunematic on this because we got all the chrome. And, you know, it's got... It, it, it's... God dang it, that's a nice sound. guitars the the archtop guitars they just they just crack me up because they're like little kids you know each one has got its own little voice it's it's really weird uh, even within models you know like this 175 compared to a, a modern one or even one from the 60s my uh my 162 62 never sounded like this, you know, maybe I would have kept it and been happier if it did. But I do wish I, I had that back. Um, so the Firefly from China, I've, I've seen those and I've thought, maybe I ought to check one of those out. You know, they got those arch tops that are like Birdlands and stuff. 
and they're like 300 bucks and I said, yeah. But I don't know, I don't wanna do that. Um, it's bad enough I, I get all these other guitars and work on them, I don't. I mean, and I was, you know what guys are doing now, right? They'll take an old guitar, especially the 125s, and without the cutaway, and they gut them, right? And then they sell the pots, the bridge, the tailpiece. You know, here's an old, and they get, they get twice as much for the guitar, at least, when they part it out. And I guess, you know, they do that with cars, right? You get a 57 Chevy, and you part that damn thing out, you'd probably get it, you know, a lot more than you could just, you know, the way it is. But who, who, who wants to do that? Um, but anyway, it's crazy, isn't it? They part them out. And, and so I've seen some of these shells, and I thought, oh, gosh, I had to get that. You know, and I thought, oh, let's see. The last shell that I did, <laughs> I think I told you this story. I found a, a neck at a Starbucks. It was just sitting outside at a Starbucks, a, a Warmoth neck, real nice guitar neck. I don't think I've ever showed the guitar you know, on live stream. Um, and uh, it's a Telecaster neck. And I thought, you know, Gail and I were there at this Starbucks. And this, the guy in back of us says, um, gosh, you know, I was here about four hours ago. And this neck was still here. And I said, really? Well, I picked it up and I took it to the guy in the front. And I said, somebody's probably going to be coming back for this. And he says, we don't keep lost and found stuff. We just throw it away. I'm like, what a, who does that? Said, yeah, we, we, we don't keep, we won't, we won't, we won't keep that. Okay. So I took it home. A few hundred dollars later, I probably, you know, I bought, you know, I buy the body, bought the pickups, bought the, Tuners, he got the switches, and I got all this fancy stuff. I had a friend of mine wire it up because it was beyond me on all this wiring. It had coil taps and all this stuff. So uh, it's a pretty cool guitar that I never play. But um, so <laughs> anyway, it ended up co that free neck cost a, a few bucks. Uh Hi, honey. Oh, you brought it. Oh, it's got a nice neck. Thank you, sweetheart. I didn't tune it. You didn't tune it? God. Where, where do you find a... Thank you. I think I can handle the tuning. What's it? Well, you know, I don't know. You, you guys want to sit around while I, while I tune it? Yeah, I don't. here it is. Boy, it'll be interesting to hear this compared to this, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's got slinky strings on it. Not a fair comparison. Uh, it's in pretty good shape. I've seen a lot worse. This is, it just needs a little love. I believe it's a 96. Got one little ding on the neck right there. Yeah, that ain't nothing. Ninety-two. Should I tune it up? What do you guys think? I'm like waiting for a response here. Um huh, crazy. Well that's nice. Anyways, we're gonna fix that up. <laughs> so on this guitar, you see those those knobs? See, these are the incorrect knobs. Do you see how they're sticking up like that? You have to have the, these kind of knobs, they have the, the they have to be inset so the the outside of it comes down, it comes closer to the thing. So I'm looking for knobs. And that's how these are, you see. See how closer the knobs are? Because they're, they're the, the part that hits that is up. The part, I can't explain it. <laughs> uh, okay, you guys are saying, okay, go for it. All right, let's do it. 
Let me unplug this. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, <laughs> this is funny, you know, this is, this live stream, I feel like um, Mr. Rogers sometimes, you know. Here comes Gail, she's got a guitar for us. Let's take a look at this. That, you know, uh, it, it just came right before we started the live stream and I was like, I don't have time to get this out. And she's like, well, I'll get it out and I'll bring it to you. So you guys gotta thank her. Um, so it made it here without being cracked and so nice, God. I'll tell you what, shipping guitars. is very tricky business. Um, yeah, the string difference will make a difference, but you'll notice the difference between a modern guitar and an old one. You, you will, you just, Intonation. Well, we'll fix all that later. <laughs> Rich is the Hugh Hauser. You, you, you know who that is? You have to explain who, who he is, Gil. He had a show called uh, Discovering California. And he would go to Yosemite and ghost towns and interview people and Okay, we're getting closer, guys. You know, this has got the knobs on them. Can you see that? On, uh, whoops. You see how they have the screw on there? So if you wanted to change to a different look, you could. That's kind of neat. Sorry. The neck is honked. I, I, I'm going to have to, I, I can't even play it unless, well, maybe this bridge just fell down. So. Ay, ay, ay. Yes, it is heavier. Oh. Oh. 
Anyway, here, here it is. Yeah, it's got light strings on it. Yeah, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, we're gonna have to work on this. Turn up the feed to us, right? How is, how's that? I had the volume turned down on the guitar. out of tune in it. Oh god. I wonder. <laughs> Get on over there. That's a little closer. Okay, when it's flat, what do you do? You shorten the string, right? I guess I should have checked that first. Okay, well, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Let me tell you about my baby. She comes around. It's perfect. Mitch Holder was telling me, by the way, here's some cool information. So after we interviewed Bruce and Bruce was talking about the Barney Castle, I got a call from Mitch Holder. Mitch used to work at Gibson. I mean, he's he knew, he knows Tal Farlow, he knows um, Barney Castle. He said, you know, the Barney Kessel guitar, the one with the two horns, was actually made for Tal Farlow first. And Tal Farlow didn't want it. Barney used it, but he never played live with it. He used it as a session guitar. Therefore, there's not too many pictures of him playing one. That's what Mitch told me. Isn't that interesting? So... The Barney Kessel guitar was not designed by Barney Kessel. It, it actually wasn't divine. Uh, uh, somebody cooked it up and Tal, they offered it to Tal Farlow. He said, nah, I don't like it. That's the, yeah, these are round wound strings. Um, do you guys like wound, round wound? You know, they're nice and bright, but I get tired of that sound. Not a bad, okay, so far it's working, isn't it? Let's play a tune with it, shall we? Let's be daring, shall we? Yeah, I'll have this guitar going tomorrow, I guess, guess tomorrow. Uh, hit the like button. Eddie Davis says that. Please do that. Thank you. It makes us happy. 
Todd taught me great intro for the Day of the Lion Roses at the camp. Well, I wish he would have told me. <laughs> We've just been going over the charts, you know, so. Uh, same thing happening to, well, interesting info about the Barney, yeah. All right, so what, one of the other uh, lessons at camp, by the way, I do this song, um, at the beginning of demonstrating this guitar, which will be out in a couple days. Gosh, I got all these other ones back here we're going to talk about too, but I figured I didn't want to, I didn't want to, uh, I guess I have the form wrong. <sighs> Whoops. You got egg on your face. You're a big disgrace. So anyway, there it is. And uh, we'll fix it up. Nice. It's, this is nice. I'm, I'm a happy boy. I'm happy, happy, happy. So yeah, that was Blues for Alice. Um, I used to own a 68 Barney Kessel. Me too. I used to own one too. I didn't think it sounded very good compared to the other guitars that I had at the time. And I thought, yeah, I, I got to sell one of these. This one I, I, I could get a good penny for. And, uh, so I sold it. Uh, let's see, where are we at here? There are copy Barney, uh, Barney Kessels out there with no Gibson logo. Yeah. Uh, my favorite is the towel, but I have an SG standard in 68, although I thought the towel was a work of art. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. 
So we we were talking about the original, um, some of the guitars that Tao had with uh, Mitch, and he was telling me about the one that he ended up playing for many, many years. Um, it was a blonde one, and it had a little scroll around the the switch, which was the switch was was on the uh, on the lower bout, unlike the Tal Farla ones later where it was in the back. So. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, um, that's that's it. Tight intro, you already know. Major to four dominant. Three six two five one. Oh, okay. Jim Rolf, good solo on BFA. <laughs> Blues for Alice. Thank you, Jim Rolfy. <laughs> Barney Sweep. Before there was Ingve. Oh, sure. You know, all those guys were doing that. But yeah. They were sweeping, a lot of sweeping going on. Um, so anyway, I also did an extensive video on this guy, which I kind of think is really a sleeper. The Aria Pro Tools 2. I keep wanting to say Pro Tools. Uh, it's Pro 2 from the um, 70s is um, a fantastic guitar. And if you're in the L5s, um, you, if you're in the L5s, then um, why not get one of these? Now, you're thinking, well, wh why would this be any better than a Sammy? Well, because it's, number one, it's vintage. And it just has got it. You got that big, fat sound. going to do a lesson on something. Um, why don't we do that now? Let's do a lesson on a seven day. Remember we were doing the seven day challenge thing? And the seven day challenge, first we started off just playing your major scale around the cycle of force. Take one shape, do it around the cycle of force. Take another shape, do it around the cycle, and then mix up the shapes as you go around the cycle of force. Remember, we did that, and we we used the E shape in this order: E A D G, E A D G C. So start with all those shapes as you go around the cycle of force. Now, this next challenge I think is built off of that same idea, and that is to play the scales in thirds around the, the cycle of force switching shapes. So in other words, if we start with C, we're going to use our E shape. Let's go to here. Whoops, that camera's gone. Where's Wes when you need him? Wes is at a surfing competition filming. Here's the scale in thirds. So that, that would be the E shape. And then we're going to come back down and we're going to do the key of F in the A shape. And now in the D shape, we're going to do the key of B flat. Okay, that was the D shape. And now C, A, G, oh wait, C, A, D, then the G shape, we're going to do the key of C, uh, no, the, 
we were in the, the B flat. Now we're going to do E flat in the G shape. You know, it's funny, it's, it's, you, you have to think, it, it just doesn't come automatic. Sometimes you, sometimes you actually have to think. Sound like Gail talking to me. And then, um, now the A, then we now we're going to use the next shape, which would be the C shape, and we're going to do the key of A flat. And then now we start all over. And now we're going to do the E shape in the key of D flat. And it goes on and on and on. So that's your challenge should you decide to accept it, Mr. Phelps. It would be good for you to, to do that. Yeah, this, this Pro 2. <laughs> Just got that big, freaking fat sound. <laughs> Let's do a West song, shall we? Oh, I like this. I love this song. Shadow of Your Smile is just a talk about songwriting. Um, just freaking brilliant song, and it's. What's it under the? <laughs> Can't it? Yeah. No, it's not under there. Wait a minute. I could have swore it's in here. Wait, where where did it go? Oh. Let me go over here. Maybe it's in here. You got several tracks here. My usual MP3 player, the one that I have all the problems with all the time on, on here, is giving me big problems again. Let's make sure this is okay. Okay, let's do that.
Okay, there it is. What am I hearing? Oh, the heater. Okay, so isn't that a cool tune? I, and, you know, so anyway, this guitar, we did another video on this. And so, yes, this is a copy of a Super 5. So it's a Super 400 neck with a, with a uh, L5 body. It is a laminate, though. So it does have a few little cracks in it, but uh, nothing to worry about because it is a laminate. Okay, anything else here? Uh, I, 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 uh, it's proved something I've thought for years. The guitar is not just the tool. The sound and the music come from the player. What is written on the headstock of this here? Area Pro Tool. Um, turn up a tad. Oh, was the guitar not loud enough? Nice was playing on Shadow of Your Smile. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I love that song and, and his version I thought was just so cool. I met jazz guys playing horns in the 60s later for what you do. I'm not on your level, but very happy to aspire. Can you jazz up Stormy Monday? Sure, you can stand jazz up anything pretty much. Uh, I can't off the top of my head right now because... They call me Storm? Well, I guess I could. I don't know. Let's see. Call, call me Storm. Oh, the key is it. They call me Storm in my name. Saturday just as bad. They call me Storm in my name. Yeah, Tuesday is just as bad. Friday, I got over the Eagle flies on Friday. Saturday, I go out to play. You can do that forever. Saturday, I go out to play. And Sunday, I go to church. And I get down on my knees to pray.
Saturday's just as worse. Yeah, baby. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, where can you get F hole blockers? Let's see. Wait a minute. Where are we at here? Anne. Anne says, been busy singing with two choirs and other stuff. Hopefully get back with lessons soon. Okay. Whatever. Music's music. It's fun, right? It's just, it, it, that's the point. Have fun. Whatever it is. You want to grow, but you want to have fun. Right? Some people like to go dune bug buggy driving. Some people like to play in a band. Some people like to go surfing. Some people like to just sing in a choir. It's all fun. You can't get hurt too badly singing in a choir. Unless somebody falls over and the whole group goes down. Okay, what did Headstock, uh, what did 175 Headstock say? What did you say? <laughs> it just says Gibson. It doesn't have anything on the back of it. There's the serial number's not on the back stuff. Hi, Rob. Robin Riggs. Hi, buddy. How you doing? It's so nice to have uh, Robin and Jim Rolfe and uh, well, all you guys here, but people that I went to school or uh, high school with. We got a history. Uh, Eddie Davis says, go to Doug's Plugs to get F-hole stuffers. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you for bringing back my friends that taught me, bro. Hmm. Well, can I buy F-hole blocker? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, where are we at, guys? I'm going to play uh, another little thing. Let's see. I wanna, I'm going to play it on the... Uh, um, back to this uh, guitar here. The 175, because I think it's got that sound that I, I could play it on the L5. Oh gosh, this is such a hard gig. Man, which guitar do I use? I'm so confused. Life's a bitch, isn't it? <laughs> God, I'm so spoiled. Anyway, um, actually, I, I, I hate that word spoiled. My, my mother had one child, me, my mother and father. Her sister had six. So, obviously, I had a lot more stuff than they, any of them did. So, therefore, I was spoiled. However, I would have traded it all to have a brother... And actually, I was in such a fear of being called spoiled. I really didn't want that much when I found out what it all meant. Then I got my guitar and it was all over with. Luckily, you know, we find music as, as you go through, you know, some... Music does a lot of things to the person playing it. So Ho Hoagie Carmichael, I, I have on my list here to play some Hoagie Carmichael. And, uh, you know, I, I I realized that that he wrote Up a Lazy River. And that's speaking of my mother. I mean, that was one of those songs that that she really liked and would play on the piano. And uh, watching the Bobby Darren story, Beyond the Sea, uh, his mother was the same way.
Okay, well, you guys, and that was a little little bit of Georgia and up a lazy river, Hoagie Carmichael. I always wondered, was Michael Carmichael related to Hoagie Carmichael? Well, look at you guys. I want to thank you all for joining me this today. We'll be back again next week, and uh, we're going to have Wes with us. I think yeah, he'll, he'll be with us. So it always makes it a little more interesting. Gail, thank you for all you do. And uh, guys, thanks for showing up. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, I think we... Um, I think we answered most everything. So um, I think let's just ease on down the road. Let's go get a burrito. You know, it's funny, you pick up this guitar here, this neck, it's like picking up a toothbrush compared to this. It's like, what? <laughs> I, I'm liking, this is a, nine, a one and nine sixteenths nut width, and I'm liking that, I'm liking it, but after being used to playing these other ones, and I haven't played this in a while, it's like, whoa, wait a minute, whoa, hold on here. So anyway, I saw a video, a guy uh, posted a video of uh, Robin Ford playing with Jimmy Witherspoon playing one like this, playing blues. It was kind of a trip. Thank you, you guys. We will see you next week with a brand new show.